Welcome in. We got another episode of the Talking Solutions podcast to hear. And in this episode, we're kind of going back to community and the power of community and platforms, specifically among parents, similar to our identity episode. This time we are highlighting Empowered Together. And Empowered Together is a fantastic online community resource uh, for parents and people to connect with one another uh, with children of disability as well. And, and basically emotional support, practical resources, things of that nature. And we have the founder, Sarah Spear, with us today. And Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Will. It's great to be here with you. Sarah, if you could just explain a little bit uh, briefly, just kind of like what I said, what is Empower Together? What is the solution that it provides? And, and what kind of compelled you uh, to start it and kind of get it going? Sure. Empower Together is a hub for parents of kids with special needs to get their emotional and practical needs met. And what started it was I joined the journey of parenthood eight years ago. And my daughter had some issues even at birth that we started investigating. And through a whole round of testing at the age of six, she received the diagnosis of a rare genetic disease called Wiedemann Steiner syndrome. And on that journey, I was trying to figure out what to do. I was referred to a parent Facebook group and there were so many different things to think about in the moment that it was overwhelming. Like see the endocrinologist, get a whole workup at the children's hospital, find a pediat pediatrician who specializes in developmental issues and find a therapist, get into ABA therapy. So there was so much going on that I just wanted to hear from other parents that were on the journey of what they had been doing. And I wanted to receive support for myself as I was on this journey. So my daughter was receiving all the support, but I needed that too. And I was talking to other parents and I wasn't all alone and feeling like I needed some help. Um, and in fact, as I dove deeper, I found research that's showing parents who receive support at the same time as their kids receive support have, uh, kids with better long-term outcomes than when parents aren't receiving support at the same time that their kids are receiving support. So I wanted to be sure that I was receiving the support while my daughter was receiving the support to ensure the best long-term outcomes for my daughter as well. And that's what set me on the journey to form Empower Together. Wow. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. And, and, and Sarah, you mentioned kind of something in there about kind of the research and what you kind of saw, like when the parents get support with the, the children that get support, there's better long-term outcomes and stuff that kind of sparks a question for me. What, what type of resources out there are there for you kind of before this kind of community platform, you mentioned things were kind of all scattered all over the place where it was it easy to find, was it difficult? And is there a lot of information out there on it or kind of just give us a little bit of background about the, um, about the situation in general and just about, you know, what it is like to kind of have and be a parent, you know, and then, you know, have the children um, that, you know, need kind of that extra care and extra help and things of that nature as well. Just kind of give us more background and whatnot of the challenges that, that these parents face. Yeah, quite frankly, there are a ton of resources available. It sometimes feels like drinking from a fire hose. I've had parents say, I just want you to tell me what I need to do. And the tricky part about that is that we need to figure that out for ourselves because each child, each parent, each family unit is unique. I can't tell someone what to do. I can offer suggestions. I can share my story. But as part of Empowered Together, we go through a parent reflection where parents take stock of their values, look at the services their kids receive, and then figure out where are their synergies there and where there's dissonance and maybe they need to begin thinking about things through a new lens. So there is a lot of community-based support for students. Uh, they also receive support in schools through special education programs, sometimes even specialized schools. And the medical community in the U.S. is really robust. Um, we also see that in a lot of Western nations. But it's wild to think that worldwide there are 240 million children facing disabilities. And uh, UNICEF has undertaken some innovative programming in Eastern Europe to ensure that kids with disabilities are receiving the support that they need that may not be immediately available in their community like it is, um, at least in the U.S. where I'm based. 
Interesting. Yeah, I would. I wouldn't have known that number. Two hundred and fifty million, like you said, that that's um, a fair. That's a good amount. Um, is Sarah, with that kind of being said and talking about the platform and the, the support and the importance of kind of getting it, but obviously every every situation is unique. Each family is unique. Each individual is unique as well. Tell us a little bit about how the platform, in and of itself, empowered together works, and how a person, a parent, of whomever can go in and kind of use it and kind of find those resources and get the support that they kind of need. Yeah, we've got tiered membership. So at a basic membership level, people come into the community for free. They connect with other parents. They can ask questions, receive recommendations and referrals. We're building our database of recommended providers so that parents can learn from other parents what providers in their area were a good fit for them. And then we also have a paid membership. And I love how that layers on expertise. And so Parents are hearing from experts in the field, like speech and language pathologists, like uh, special education advocates, what the parents ought to know. We actually have a series going on right now, What I Wish Parents Knew. And every time I talk with a provider, I ask, what do you wish that parents knew? And I'm amazed at the responses that parents, they, they wish parents knew that their kids aren't broken, that they don't need fixing. They're just wired differently. Or for parents to be curious about what's going on in their own lives that impacts how they parent, how they show up. And so parents get access to these resources in the community. And then at that enhanced paid membership level, they also get access to guest speakers and a community time where they come together for synchronous learning and processing with a community of their peers. And I find that to be a really powerful time because that's purely focused on the parent and on their needs and want talking through the challenges that they're facing, um, but also the wins and what they're grateful for, because we're on these wild journeys with kids who are probably very different than what we anticipated encountering on our parenting journeys. And it's actually fabulous. And it can be really hard, and we share that too, but we also share just the wonder and the special aspect of what we're called to in parenting these amazing kids. Yeah, I love that, like sharing the wins and everything as well, and just the positive things that are going on. I mean, the community, you know, it should be kind of, you know, I feel like uplifting and helpful and resourceful uh, for things kind of all over the place. And so I really like that aspect to, to make it so it's, you know, also sharing wins, you know, not just some of the challenges, but also some of the great victories and the beautiful things that are happening with it as well. Um, you mentioned kind of the, the healthcare providers and the doctors and stuff and, and kind of getting information from them. How much of your kind of research into this and whatnot had to deal with you kind of connecting with some of these um, kind of providers and things of that nature and kind of getting their feedback and kind of understanding and, and then using those as kind of like a, a point where you can kind of get the ideas for the resources that you're going to provide on the platform? Yeah, Empowered Together is definitely informed by my personal journey and the various specialists that my daughter needed to see. Um, and that's also given me entree to have conversations with other parents who have been on a similar journey parenting a child with special needs, but maybe it's different than my daughter who has a rare genetic disease and the door opens for a lot of things because of that for her, whereas a parent whose child is diagnosed with anxiety um, and depression may not have access to all of the same levels of support. So then for me, it becomes this question of, okay, how does that parent navigate the world and the systems as they exist today to ensure that her child as well gets the support that she needs? So I do a lot of calling around and talking to experts to understand, um, okay, what's available? I've even called insurance companies on behalf of Empowered Together members to understand what their, um, you know, with the, with the parents' permission, the insurance company's um, agreement as well, to understand what's available for these parents that maybe they're not tapping into that they could tap into. Um, and then the other piece I think that's important is because there's this wealth of information out there, because there are so many practitioners, uh, it's imperative to ensure that parents and their kids get in connection with um, reliable sources of information and support. And so that's another piece where Empowered Together comes in to ensure that these services that are being provided are the right fit for the family um, and also the right kind of expertise. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned kind of the, the right information and kind of getting access to it as well. And, and, you know, nowadays with the internet and everything, it's, it's, you know, when you search for anything and any type of problem, no matter what it is, you can get an answer that basically supports whatever it is you're looking for and whatnot as well. So what types of challenges have you kind of faced in terms of getting those right resources in and making sure that they're the exact kind of ones that you want to see? Or maybe how do you, you know, tell these parents to do kind of their research on the platform? Is that part of it to kind of help them in that journey? Because you make kind of a good point on that sense where there's so much kind of information around and different resources. It's, it's important to make sure you're kind of getting ones that obviously are accurate and, and that can be um, useful and helpful. Yeah, well, I love your point. We basically can find anything on the internet to support what we're thinking or the research that backs up the direction we want to go in. So we do ground our methodologies in research, uh, taking a look at the what works in peer support models, uh, what a parent frame looks like in our community time, that's our synchronous learning time for our paid members, and we ensure that we're grounding our practices in what research is demonstrating is effective. Um, like I said, we also have a parent reflection tool that members go through where they take a look at what they value, what they what's important for them to find in a provider, and then also what their child is receiving, and kind of start asking questions, start exploring, um, is this therapy that my child's receiving effective? Is the therapist talking to the school clinician? Would the special ed teacher be able to be brought into this? And start connecting the dots. So we also chart out a plan of, hey, this is going to be the next six months of questions that you're exploring and then mapping out even at a weekly level. Uh, we did this with our pilot in the summer. What are the steps you're taking this week? And as humans, it can feel defeatist to feel like something didn't work. But Empowered Together has very much a mindset of any step forward is progress. So if you try something and it didn't work, that's progress because you figured out that that doesn't work. So now think about what are the next steps that you're going to take towards reaching a solution. And the saying that the days are long, but the years are short really applies in this situation. Um, parenting kids with special needs can feel exhausting. And I think it's very easy for parents and primary caregivers to get caught in the moment of this is what it's always going to be like. We know the reality is that it's not always going to be like that, but to figure out, okay, what are the steps that we can take to continue moving forward on this journey and not getting stuck in that is something that we put into practice. I love that. I think that that's such a really great and healthy way to kind of approach it and look at it like the small wins, right? Like if you can just focus on what's in front of you and then kind of get the victory there, whether that's, okay, that didn't work. I know it didn't work. And now I've learned from it and can move forward to try to find something else that does work, you know, and especially when you kind of look at something like this, where it can be, it can be really intimidating and from a overall spectrum to look at, I would, I would imagine, obviously I'm not speaking from any personal experience, but just from, you know, what I would think it would be, it could be overwhelming to kind of see all that. To, so to focus on kind of the smaller steps in the community build and, the, and then going back to what you said at the beginning, we're focusing on the wins is important. I feel like that's where the community really could really thrive and execute and really see kind of the most benefits and whatnot. Is, would you kind of agree with that or? Yeah, absolutely. And it reminds me of how you and I originally connected via the Authentech community, where people are viewed no longer as commodities, but as community members. And doing that work in the community of peers that Empowered Together has around primary caregivers and kids with special needs in particular is really powerful. Anytime we're coming together with a group of our peers, we automatically have some accountability built into that system that helps us to move forward. Because not only do we know that people are going to be checking in on anything that we say we're going to be doing, but we also are working on it in a community of people who understand, who just get it, what parents like to say. And I think of that even on this entrepreneurial journey, to be able to be in the authentic Slack group, to know that, that the people in that channel get what's 
going on and we can share our frustrations. I think there's so much beauty in surrounding ourselves by people who are on similar journeys that we can learn from and also empathize with and receive empathy from too. Yeah, exactly. And, and you mentioned the authentic community and just community platforms in general, really the, the authentic and what that's kind of doing, like you mentioned, to, to not be commodities, but to be part of community and whatnot. It's such an important part. And, you know, the Internet can be a really interesting place, right? I mean, you can, it can be toxic and, and bad and negative, but it can also be incredibly uplifting, inspirational and helpful. It's really just kind of how you use it. And these types of platforms and programs are, are designed to be more uplifting, inspirational, helpful uh, educational and, and all those important things on that front. Um, Sarah, before we kind of move on and talk about some other things as well, I just want to give you an opportunity. You mentioned that there's kind of a, a free and a paid platform with the uh, um, community as well. Uh, what exactly does that cost? And are there tiers? Is it just one paid, one free? Or is there a couple of different paid options or whatnot? And then what people can expect to, to pay on that front to kind of enter in if they're interested in doing so? Yeah, it's folks are interested, they can go to empoweredtogether.us and request to join. We do have our community behind a login, and that's for the pure reason that the community is created for parents and primary caregivers of people with special needs. So those are the people who are in our community, and it is only those people. And people are, will, are able to go to empoweredtogether.us to learn more and to follow us on social media if they want to. Absolutely, we welcome those um, like-minded supporters. And we have a free membership, and we also have a $15 a month paid membership. That's the, those are the two tiers. We also have enterprise partners. And so for anybody who's part of a center serving people with special needs, uh, that's sort of a one-on-one -on -one conversation that Empire Together has with that enterprise. And they can reach out to us as well, contact at Empire Together at US. Awesome. And then we talked a little bit about what the platform does now, what people could expect. You laid out some of the features, what they can find, community resources, paid program. You can get webinars, things of that nature as well from professionals and stuff. But I'm curious to kind of know, Sarah, you know, what do you have planned for the future? You know, what stage kind of are you at in your mind with the company? Where would you like to go in the future? How would you like to kind of build upon this uh, and uh, really your goals, dreams for uh, empowerment or empowered together? Yeah. Something that's probably true of many different industries is I get to talk with a lot of folks who are working on solutions in this space of special needs. And I'm constantly humbled and amazed and inspired by what other people are working on. So I would like Empower Together to be that hub where parents come and then they get support from lots of different startups. I think of one who's working on an IEP solution, one that's working on a document organizing solution, um, one that's working on learning tools for autistic children. And so for a parent to come and find vetted resources that are trusted, that are grounded in research, that are proving effective is what I'm imagining. Uh, and not only that hub for the solutions and finding ideal providers, but also for the emotional support, because so often, and I think this is really true of any humans, we get so focused on just what is the thing we need to do today that it's hard to slow down and think about ourselves as humans and remember that we carry a lot and we always do better when we have an opportunity to reflect on what's going on. And actually, this is also some of what Empowered Together does with our parent reflection, again, grounding and grounded in research, that when we reflect on what we've been doing, our next steps become more effective because we get the opportunity to pause and think about what we've done and what the outcome has been, and then think about how we want to go about things next time. So I would say I always want that emotional support piece and the parent-focused frame to use more therapeutic language to be a mainstay of what Empowered Together does. Yeah, that's so great to, to really just kind of focus in on that and whatnot and, and the important part of reflecting and wh where you've come from, how far you've come, where you're at, what you've improved on, what you've learned. I mean, it's really a great point for a mental health perspective as well on that front. I mean, I think it's super, super important. Um, curious to, to hear you mentioned that, you know, a lot of this has come from your experience and what, you know, you've gone through and stuff and then talking to other parents and things of that nature as well. 
what type of feedback are you getting when you're kind of pitching this idea to newer people or, or feedback you get from people that just joined the platform and they kind of can check out the community and whatnot? You know, what are people kind of saying uh, about it? And, and, you know, how much of that goes into your decision to kind of uh, iterate and improve on the community as well, just getting that feedback from other parents in the community? Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of conversations I've had recently have been around parents just looking for resources, which is definitely focusing me on the database that we're already creating to um, try to build that to be more robust so that parents are finding the resources that they need in an easy manner. Um, when I was doing early customer discovery, I spoke with parents who said, oh, I just wish this existed at the beginning of my journey. And similarly, speaking with professionals, they're saying parents are have the most critical needs when their child has just received a diagnosis and the parent's trying to figure out what in the world do I need to do. And something that I get excited about is being present at that early stage. It's really honoring and humbling to be able to be invited into somebody's space in that way because that's a really um, vulnerable time. If I think back to when I... <laughs> The medical community has a ways to go in bedside manner, but that's a totally separate uh, discussion. But I still have this visceral reaction to thinking about the day an envelope came in the mail with my daughter's results. I got that and I saw on paper that she had this rare genetic disease. I had a call with the geneticist saying, okay, you have the results. Um, there's a Facebook group you can join. Good luck. And it just was so overwhelming. Like, okay, I don't know anything about this disease. So of course, I'm going to go Google it. Um, I don't know who to see from here, but the geneticist said basically her job is done. So to be able to play a role in that and, like, okay, we're going to take a deep breath. We're going to figure out what steps are needed. We're going to work on this together. Um, is this a really beautiful thing? Yeah, it adds in the empathy to it, right? Like, I mean, a lot of, the, I don't want to, you know, not all the medical professionals are like this or whatnot, right? But I mean, they're just so used to seeing things every day that sometimes I think it kind of goes over the head of, you know, the impact that it can have on like a family or something. And like you said, sometimes they get this information with a bunch of these medical terms that they don't even understand. And then they got nowhere to go for, in for you know, to get kind of the support or the community. And so I think that's another great uh, use for it as well on this and just the that ability and whatnot to, get some more empathy into it. And, and I think that goes back kind of to what you were talking about with the um, authentic industry as a whole, where it's more community instead of just treating humans as commodities and stuff like that. Like, I feel like empathy um, is really important in, in situations like these. What, what do you think on that? Yeah, absolutely. And I also think of that feedback I received. Of, I just wish somebody could tell me what to do. And so folks that empower together empathize with that and also rally around an individual who's in that space think, and then encourage them to think what they need to do. Because parents know their children best. This, it's actually the same person who had that idea of, I just wish somebody would tell me what to do. Also wish that the professionals whom she met with believed her um and ask her more questions listen to what she had to say about her daughter parents are the ones who spend probably the most time with their kids um or see their kids when they're at their most natural when they're not having to like hold it all together to make it through the school day and not melt down and so i think parents are hesitant to um kind of apply that muscle because they think I'm not a professional. This isn't something I'm trained in. The school is staffed by professionals. The doctor's office is staffed by professionals. The therapists are all professionals. But me, I'm just a parent. And yet, we want to encourage parents to lean into that intuition, lean into what they're noticing with their kid, and encourage them to stand up and have their voice heard. And this is a thing that one of the things that really inspired me with Empowered Together as well was um, empowering parents 
whose voices may have been marginalized. Empowering parents who, due to previous experiences with authority, may feel really nervous about going into a PPT meeting at the school and asking for what they want for their child, or even like using exploratory language of, hey, we're on the same team here, we want what's best for my kid. Could we do some more testing? And we have we encounter parents who have been so kicked to the curb by society that they're scared to ask those questions. They're scared to push back when an authority figure is suggesting they do something differently. But if we can encourage parents to build and then flex those muscles a bit, it actually leads to the better long-term outcomes for the kids and also the better outcomes for the parents, which again, impacts the kids. So that's the virtuous cycle there. Interesting. Yeah, it's kind of all kind of connected together on that front and, and whatnot, where it kind of goes from as well. And you, and you mentioned a couple of things well, within that, it kind of sparks this other question as well. And this is, you know, something from my anecdotal experience, maybe something that um, you have a different kind of viewpoint on and things of that nature as well. But I feel like, you know, in today's in the US speaking specifically, uh, I won't say for other countries and whatnot, but in the US specifically today, I feel like when we're talking about kind of like, you know, equality to access and things of that nature as well. One one area that I never really get heard be brought up much is, you know, special needs and that type of assistance and things of that nature as well. So how much of that do you think is a challenge uh, as well when kind of getting within this platform and whatnot, because maybe it doesn't quite get as much uh, attention or coverage or whatnot as uh, some of the other areas? Yeah, it's a great point. And this is something that I do feel passionate about, Will that disability is something that as a society, we're uncomfortable talking about. Um, and having lived in other places, I lived in India for years and it was not talked about at all. Um, not to say that we're any better off in the US, but just I think around the world, it's fair to say that this is a conversation that needs to be had but we're, we're very uncomfortable with it and we've shied away from it. So my hope is that as conversations around equity, inclusion, access, diversity are undertaken, we continue thinking about disability as um, something that we need to talk about. And if the past two years have taught us anything, I think the good news is that they've taught us that we can learn, we can grow, we can get through discomfort and come through on the other side. And I am seeing glimmers of hope that get me really excited. So for example, um, there are nutritional supplements that are covered by Medicaid for diabetic patients. But you have to have something, uh, a diagnosis specific to diabetes or maybe some sort of um, other organ failure. And so the cool thing is now Medicaid is opening coverage for nutritional supplements to a much broader range of needs. So it's just one data point that's pointing to an opening of this conversation. And I'm embarking on a seven month program called Partners in Policymaking here in Connecticut where I live. And so at a state level on a monthly basis, we're undertaking a weekend of learning and this is involving both those with disabilities and those who are advocating on behalf of those with disabilities. And so this weekend is our first session. And part of it is learning about the history of the disability movement, starting with the parent movement, when parents were really driving this, and now coming to today where it's a patient-led movement. So that's also really exciting that um, not only are patients empowered to, or people, um, let them, not only are those with disabilities uh, empowered to use their voices, but they're also being listened to. And so those are glimmers of hope for me as I think about wanting to continue pushing this conversation forward around access and inclusion for those with disabilities and special needs. And also, final point, neurodiversity is a buzzword. Uh, and if folks aren't familiar with it, they should explore a little more. It, really focuses on different ways of thinking that may be different from like a very type A um, 
way of thinking. And not to say that anything is wrong or broken, but these are just different ways of thinking and our world is better because we are populated by people who think in all sorts of diverse ways. So the movement towards appreciation for neurodiversity is yet another uh, glimmer of hope as we think about this. Interesting. Yeah, I haven't heard of neurodiversity. So that's uh, something that I'll have to go in to explore and take your advice on a little bit on that, because you make a great point. I mean, each and every person, you know, might think differently and they're shaped by their own perspectives and experience, which kind of give them that, you know, outlook on the world as they see it or whatnot. Right. So um, I think that's really interesting. Uh, I think it's so cool that you're, you're creating and kind of doing things to push this conversation forward so that it happens more often and that people are more aware and that there's more uh, fight to kind of get that uh, equal access and whatnot. Sarah, what type of advice do you have for someone who might be apprehensive, you know, like you said, uncomfortable at the beginning about talking about these things or learning more about it because, you know, they might be worried about saying something wrong or something like that. What piece of advice would you have for people to kind of get themselves more familiar in this, more aware of this uh, issue, and then being able to kind of move forward on it and being more comfortable in and of themselves uh, to help kind of promote the the cause and the push to kind of provide more equal access to this? I love that question, Will. And quite honestly, it's because it's a question that I've asked myself. Like, I don't want to step on these unseen landmines. And I've been a part of Facebook groups enough to know that certain things are really triggering, um, particularly in the neurodiverse community. And so I want to learn um, I also think it's important for folks to find people that are gracious to rather than saying we're going to cancel you are going to engage in a conversation um, to understand like to appreciate somebody wants to learn wants to know better so they can do better and um, also is, is willing to share what they know so Folks could follow Empowered Together on social media. We put out little bits kind of drip feeding this sort of information. That could be a really simple way to start. Um, and I will probably circle back with maybe something else you could put in the show notes around some other pieces that people could do um, just to begin exploring more. I think on the neurodiversity front, literally Googling neurodiversity and start starting to read about that is helpful. That's something that will begin to impact lots of businesses because I'm seeing trends towards hiring, like an openness to hire autistic individuals, for example, um, and finding ways to engineer a work environment that supports people abroad, across a broad array of thinking and how our brains are wired. So um, there's also that, I think, really practical reason to become, to get up to speed on this, that it's going to begin shaping the landscape of our employment as well. Yeah, that's a really great point. I mean, just Googling it and getting a better understanding, you know, I think as uh, and this is a little bit of a side note as well, but, you know, I think as we grow as humans and whatnot, you know, it is kind of like, hey, you know, we think it's the conundrum where a lot of humans think we kind of know everything, but at the same time, there's so much we don't even know about our own brains and how they work and how different people think and how the chemical reactions flow and things of that nature. So it's, it's really interesting. I think that's a great point to just kind of be able to learn about that first and foremost. It will give you a kind of that uh, basic level of understanding, and then you can kind of use those of what you learn to apply it to you know, getting the, uh, the empathy and understanding and how that might be different for some others and some of the challenges other people might face and things of that nature as well, uh, particularly in the in the special needs community on that front. Um, Sarah, I want to ask you too, just about the challenges of kind of growing a, an authentic company, a social entrepreneurship style company and whatnot, you know, as a founder, you know, what types of things are are you facing that are you are seeing as kind of the most difficult and what to, and how are you kind of overcoming that and, and doing it yourself and whatnot? Yeah, I was thinking about this question and what keeps coming up is that there was such an expectation that I would form a nonprofit or quite honestly, um, people just assume that Empowered Together is a nonprofit, which it is not. It's currently an LLC because 
if the product market fit is there, the market's going to bear this cost somehow. We need to figure this out. We need to resource parents so that they have improved outcomes and so that their kids with special needs have improved long-term outcomes. And earlier intervention leads to those better long-term outcomes as well. So I would say overcoming that stigma is just a funny one that often happens in the social enterprise space. And it's also been interesting to think about how to grow community, um, both in terms of members, but also engagement and being very cognizant of where we are at this time in history. So as you and I are recording, we're coming up on two years of the pandemic and we have a virtual platform that empower together which is great because people from around the world can connect and get answers, get support, learn in synchronous and asynchronous ways. And that's by design. There's also just this desire to get in, get information, get out, and not want to be hanging out um, on social media. And I think that's a healthy thing, quite honestly. So that's been an interesting an exciting challenge to figure out how does Empower Together resource parents in the ways that they need to make progress on their journey to be the parents they wanna be, um, while also respecting that our measurements for engagement may be a little bit, are gonna be actually widely different than say a Facebook wants to keep people on the platform. Like, that's actually not what we wanna do at all. We wanna encourage parents to get what they need, but then get out and spend time with your kids. Do things that are going to be life-giving and um, growing those relationships that you have in your family and your community. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. The growth prospect of it kind of all. And Sarah, one thing I, I also want to ask and something that you have experience with that I think might be unique to some others is you have you know spent some time living abroad, kind of like what you mentioned um, and whatnot in your experience. Where do you see this in terms of a global level because we talked a lot about kind of in the u.s i know you mentioned something globally speaking a little bit earlier but where do you see this amongst how other countries see it and how it's treated and things of that nature as well just in your own experience of kind of living abroad and um and whatnot in your life's journey yeah um i get really excited when i think about that because as much as i feel the need as a parent in the u.s where there are 31 million households impacted by special needs as we think about the 240 million kids with special needs or disabilities worldwide, I know that there are parents in places that have even less support than we have in the US. And so I get really excited about this virtual platform that parents can connect to, to receive support. Because I think these conversations often need to happen in a psychologically safe space so that the parent can be affirmed in how they're seeing things in the power that they have as a parent um, before they go out and advocate on behalf of their child. If they're going into what we feel like a hostile environment where nobody's taking them seriously or disability isn't talked about. I remember walking down a street in Delhi, India, where I lived and I saw a child with a genetic disease and I had never seen another individual with any presenting disability like that walking down the street before. And it just brought home to me the fact that folks who have disability exist, and yet they're often kept indoors where the general public isn't going to encounter um, those with disabilities. And, and it, I think to, center our own comfort and ensure that we can navigate our environment in a comfortable way. But I want to empower parents who may be living in places where disability conversations aren't happening at all to uh, encourage them to build them up. And what they're doing in parenting period is, is a, an act of hope um, that they see that there is hope for the future and they're going to hang in there and they're going to parent. And I want parents to be affirmed in that, but also be resourced to figure out how they can um, be the best parent they can be. 
Amazing. Yeah, it'd be really cool to kind of see how it evolves over time, especially on the platform in terms of, you know, you this could be really cool in the sense that this could be a platform for everybody globally, uh, like you mentioned, and that maybe are in countries where they're not talking about it as often, or they, you know, it's more uncomfortable or whatever it might be, um, depending how it goes. And, and this is an opportunity for them to get on it. It might be kind of cool from, you know, your perspective as well, when you're looking at the, the platform and you're seeing different languages and things of that nature and community spaces and all that type of stuff, it would be pretty cool to kind of see how that evolves over time. So that's pretty exciting. I really like that kind of vision that you have for it. It's, uh, it's pretty inspiring, you know? Thanks, Bill. We'll check in in a year or two and see how that's going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Sarah, I want to give you an opportunity as well to just let us know, like, what else can people be doing to support Empower Together um, and, and really create awareness around it so that it is an opportunity for people to get on it, like we just talked about, and, and support one another and get resources and get help and get you know, documentation and all these types of things that are going to be so helpful in their journey and whatnot, uplifting wins, positivity, like how, how could people kind of support uh, the platform and the community and whatnot uh, that you have going on? Yeah, for anybody who identifies as a parent or a primary caregiver of a child with special needs, we welcome you to join Empower Together. You just request to join at empoweredtogether.us. And for those who aren't a parent or primary caregiver, but are interested in following us, we have social media handles. I'm sure you can put in the show notes. And we'd love for people to follow along and engage in this conversation. Um, I think I, I am hoping that Empower Together is creating a safe space for anybody who's interested in learning to engage in the conversation because that is a critical role that we can play sort of externally focused on people um, appreciating those with disability, appreciating those who are neurodivergent, and appreciating those with special needs in a way that the individuals are viewed as individuals not worthy of pity, but as fellow human beings that we can build relationships with, we can interact with. And um, that's another piece we didn't dive too deeply into, but I think that there is a bit of a syndrome of, of pitying people with special needs and their parents or somehow glorifying parents as though we are saints for parenting kids with special needs. And let me clear up any misunderstanding. We have really hard days. We have really bad times when we don't show up as the parents that we know we ought to be. So I don't think we're worthy of glorying, but, um, but really engaging in in relationship with and learning more about us. Um, but back to the question of Empowered Together, parents and caregivers can request to join. And for those who are part of a special needs center, I'd love introductions. We'd love to talk about how they're resourcing their parents and whether there's any way to partner there as well. And uh, they can email me about that. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. And again, it goes back to the name, right? It's empowered together. We don't want to, you know, the pity or anything. It's uplifting. It's empowering and, and giving an opportunity to to kind of create that community platform of support with you as well. So Sarah, anything else that you would like to add that uh, maybe we missed uh, in the podcast that you'd like people to know? I think that's it, Well, I appreciate this opportunity to uh, talk more about disability, how it's impacting our world today but also how, because I know those who listen to your podcast are genuine in their desire to see a better world. So I love being able to talk about what that looks like in and among the disability community. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much for for coming on the show and having this conversation with us. It's certainly something that I think needs to have a little bit more awareness out there, like we talked about in the podcast, and, and to really kind of push it forward so that there is opportunity to feel, you know, for people to feel like they can talk about this and, and to empower these people and to kind of uplift this platform a little bit more. So I thank you so much for coming on the show. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Will. Me too. That's Sarah Spears. She's the founder of Empowered Together. You can find out more information at empoweredtogether.us. That is the website. Also, you can follow them on social media, Empowered Together Co. And then, of course, we'll have all of their social media and links and whatnot within our uh, platform on Instagram and then on our website 
there'll be a little uh, at cheshtech.com, there'll be a little section uh, for Empower Together as well so that you can get more information. And this is going to wrap up this edition of the Talk and Solutions to Chesh podcast. As always, you can get all of the episodes and more on your favorite platforms through Apple, Spotify, and on YouTube as well. So stay tuned on Instagram for the week to get more information on Empower Together. And also uh, be sure to drop us a review if you like the podcast on Spotify and on iTunes and on YouTube as well. So thanks so much for tuning in and looking forward to the next episode of the Talking Solutions podcast. Enjoy the rest of your week. 